Welcome to our service. My name is Lori Mickelson and I pastor the Northern Lights Christian Fellowship Church of the Nazarene here in Chetwin. Let's pray. O oh Lord, help us to focus on you and your big picture. We're grateful for the way that you've been with your church all throughout this past year. O oh Lord, we ask that you strengthen us and give us a boldness to preach, teach, and live the gospel in all parts of our lives. Help us to remain steadfast. Amen. If we looked at the church of, in Laodicea in chapter 1, or chapter 2. We were reminded of the warning that had been issued by John in Revelation as to what God had found wrong with the church and how to fix it. Today we're going to take a look at what the church should be doing. Now I'm not talking about the church as a building. I am talking about church as the people because that is what real church is. Each and every person who has accepted Christ as their personal savior and is actively involved in doing his will. Now we always have to be able to take God's word and apply it to our lives in the 21st century. And it may be even more important as we consider his word and the day and age that we live in post pandemic. So much has changed in the past two years and I'm not sure that all of it has been a good change. I never thought I would see the day in Canada that Christians would be unable to come together in person to worship. But then again, I never imagined a global pandemic either. I've been asked many times if what we're seeing is persecution. We've all seen the news stories and reports of pastors and churches who have defied the authorities in order to worship together, often while flaunting public health protocols. They've been arrested and fined and they've had their churches locked up and fenced off and they often provided scriptural justification. They've defiantly stood on the front steps of their church while quoting Hebrews 10 verse 25, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. But that same Bible contains the words of Hebrews 10, that contains the words of Hebrews 10, also contains Romans 13, one to two everyone must submit to governing authorities for all authority comes from God and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and they will be punished. The church has been gathering together for 2000 plus years in good times and in bad. During the times they were persecuted, during the times when they were promoted and during the times when they were simply tolerated. But that doesn't mean the church has been gathering in large groups or buildings for all those years. Now I like it when church gathers together, but the fact is we've been following basically the same restrictions as other public gatherings, and yes, it may be annoying and frustrating. Sometimes when other things open a couple weeks earlier than we can, it didn't seem fair, and maybe it's not. But to me that isn't persecution. This past two years have been the strangest two years that I've encountered in my life. We've had services without anyone present other than Marlon and I that were later broadcast on the local TV station or YouTube. We had services where we met in person, but we had scripture reading, a message, no singing. We've had emergency services where we've held communion in a quickly arranged service before the churches were shut down again. And we've emailed and hand delivered messages when it was impossible to meet and we've had services outside in the parking lot. And all through this time, God has been faithful. He's been with us every step of the way. His message gets out. But now that things are opening up, we're praying that we can up the program. There's much to be done. So let's see what Paul tells the Colossians about the church's role in the life of the believer. All the while remembering that the true church is in the hearts and the minds of God's people and not in the building. Verse, Colossians 3, verse 1 to 4. Since you have been raised to a new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. Paul brings his readers back to the focus of their lives the big picture, so to speak. Paul tells us that our sights should be set on the realities of heaven. 
When we do that, we let heaven fill our thoughts on the eternal rather than the here and the now. When we first accepted Christ, we have and are continuing to be morally and ethically changed to be more like Christ. Our focus changes, or it should. Our true home is where Christ lives, and our focus is to be on what Christ has planned for those who love and serve him. We look at life from God's perspective. We seek what God desires. The goals and direction of the world no longer rules our lives. So what does it mean when the believer's life is hidden in Christ? The word hidden means concealed and safe. While our service and behavior does not earn our salvation, they are results of our salvation, the fruits of our salvation, so to speak. For the rest of this chapter, Paul explains how believers should act now, today, in 2021, in order to prepare for Christ's return. Verses 5 to 10. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshipping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. We read this list of what many consider rules and regulations, but think for a moment. What if we followed all of these? Our district superintendent, Pastor Gordon, challenged us with a what-if challenge at district assembly, and this is what the challenge was. Might that we would all commit to have more and more what-if conversations. In our board meetings, what if? From our pulpits and in our Sunday school classes, what if? Over coffee with other believers in your circles, what if? As you drive past that other new townhouse complex being built, dare to dream, what if? When you catch yourself looking with judgment towards those people you just don't understand, might you find the courage to ask, what if? When you are in your quiet time with the Lord, would you ask him to bring a new missional idea to your imagination and there, in the presence of the all-sufficient God, boldly ask him, what if? Well, this is the first set of what if questions you've heard in a Sunday message. Put that question before each of those questions and then ponder them for a while. Pray about them. Search the scriptures for answers. Putting that question before what Paul wrote in just the verses 5 to 10 brought some interesting thoughts. Wouldn't it be easier to get along with others if we weren't slaves to anger and slander? Wouldn't our minds be more at peace if we didn't lie and have to spend so much time trying to cover it up or justify it? Wouldn't it be easier to hold a reasonable conversation with others if we weren't trying to make ourselves better than we really are? In other words, wouldn't the world be a better place if we operated under the umbrella of God's love instead of trying to do what we want? God created us in his own image, and what he's trying to do with us is to renew that image in each one of us so that we can be with him in eternity. It's important. Without that change of heart and mind, we are lost. So what if we read Paul's messages and follow them? Not only would be, we be gifted with eternity, we would find so much easier to navigate the trials and pressures of the world around us, and we would be able to do it with peace. I am reminded of the words from the Beatitudes found in Matthew 5, verse 3 to 10. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Being blessed means much more than happiness. These beatitudes don't necessarily promise laughter, pleasure, or earthly prosperity. They mean a personal experience of hope and joy and peace in the heart 
despite outside circumstances. It promises the presence of God in, through, and with all things. Now back to Colossians. Who are these promises available to? Verse 11. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. It doesn't matter who you are if you believe in Christ and follow him. You belong to the church, the body of Christ. Christ accepts all people who come to him. There is no place in God's church for barriers of race, nationality, gender, or education. As believers, we should be building bridges and not erecting walls to keep people out. Verses 12 to 17. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom that he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Paul gives the churches a plan to help us live for God every day. One, imitate Christ's compassionate, forgiving attitude. The key to forgiving others is to remember how much God has forgiven us. When we realize just how much God has loved and forgiven us, it can remind us to forgive others. We can let God worry about the wrongs that we've suffered. Number two, let love guide your life. Number three, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Paul tells God's church to let Christ's peace be the referee in your heart. It is the heart that is the center of conflict because that is where our feelings and our desires clash. Our fears and our hopes are stored. Distrust and trust reside, and jealousy and love live. This does not mean peace at all costs. It means that we work together despite our differences. It's a choice. Number four, always be thankful. Here comes another what if question. What if every morning we took an inventory of all we have and used that inventory for prayers of gratitude? On Sunday morning, instead of rushing around, we make the deliberate choice to pause and declare Sunday as your thanks, faith, and hope day. Number five, keep God's word in you at all times. Number six, live as Jesus' representative here on earth. This sounds like a tall order, but all of these virtues that Paul encourages the church to develop are perfectly tied together. That holds everything in place. Oh, the possibilities for a life of peace in spite of circumstances. Oh, the possibility for a life filled with love for the world around us. Oh, the possibility for a life of gratitude for how good God has been to us and has guided us this far. I think I like the what if challenge issued by Pastor Gordon. It offers hope. So have a blessed week ahead and keep looking up. Mm -hmm.